if, if I'm a Kabbalist, I can't say that God exists. It's, it's a, a false statement. It's not a true statement because God is beyond existence. Welcome, Rabbi Naor Betzalel. How can we refer to you here? What's the preferred term? <laughs> questions, questions. Well, uh, my name is Betzalel. My, na my name is also Naor. There's a lot of symbolism in there, in those names. How would how would you like to address me? <laughs> I've never had that question turned back on me. I think I think it's actually um, case sensitive. So I think there's times in a conversation where it's more appropriate to refer to someone by the first name, and times where it's more appropriate to use a titular um, name, like like rabbi or professor. So let's start with let's start with rabbi because we're going to be laying out the the scope of the conversation, and that will bring a bit of of rabbinic gravitas to what we hope to be talking about, because we're talking about holy matters here. And, and hopefully we'll be able to combine the holy and the personal, the intimate and the, and the sacred. And, and let's see, let's see a look at that. So we made up in short exchange to, to begin by discussing your journey and how you came to study Rev Cook, who for the listeners who don't yet know who Rev Cook is, by the time you've finished listening to this interview, God willing, in the future, you will very much be acquainted with the name of that great man. We hope to discuss Rev Cook's universal vision as a messianic mystic, Rev Cook's perspective on outside philosophies and religions, and how they perhaps converge to point to the redemption of mankind and God. We hope to talk about Rev Cook's strange paradox between his universalism and particularism, both in religion and politics. And we hope to situate Rav Kook within the context of other philosophical mystics, perennialists, Jewish universalists, thinkers that we're generally quite interested here at Seekers of Unity, and how he's partaking in that tradition and perhaps extending it and pushing it forward. We hope to speak about Rav Kook's legacy as he's been received by the next generation by his quite fascinating and controversial students and children, both the censored and uncensored, both the hated and loved Rav Kook, and the work that you've been doing as well to try and uncover the the censor of Cook, perhaps, and and the and the place that he plays today in, in Jewish uh, thought, particularly here in Israel, as perhaps the the patron saint of religious Zionism. Rav Cook is really a a very rich enigmatic character, and I'm going actually not to try and talk too much about him because we have one of the world's experts here, I think, on Rav Cook sitting across from us, and we welcome Rabbi Betzal Naar to Seekers of Unity. Rabbi Naar is an author and teacher. Rabbi Naar's work spans the spectrum of Jewish thought, truly, with his specialization and passion being most in Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, Shabbatinism, and Hasidism. He is perhaps best known, although, for his work, as we've been saying, on Rav Kook, one of the great Jewish thinkers and mystics of all times, of who Rabbi Naar is a lifelong student and a preeminent scholar and noted translator. In 1990, Rabbi Naar founded Arat Incorporated with the express purpose of disseminating the teachings and thought of Rav Cook, Rabbi Noor has written several books, including but not limited to "When God Becomes History," "Post Shabbatian Shabbatianism," "From a Kabbalist Diary," "Bringing Down Dreams," "Exploring the Lost Art of Jewish Dream Interpretation," "The Limits of Intellectual Freedom," and Rabbi Noor is also working on a Kabbalistic historical novel as well as a collection of mystical poems. I have read much of your work, and there is something very alive and captivating by your work. One does not feel besides for the tremendous depth of scholarship and first-hand intimacy with the primary sources in a way that's truly astounding, more than that, there is a real sense of, of life and vitality and passion in your writings where the subjects really pop off the pages and come to life. And for anyone who these great thinkers are really are merely just historical characters, encountering them through your work makes them really living characters. And I, I can it would be I would be hard strained to think of another contemporary thinker and writer such as yourself who really brings these rich, very often difficult and obscure characters to such vivid life. And for that, I'm in great debt of gratitude. And I thank you, Rabbi Naar, and I thank you for joining us here at Seekers of Unity. Wow. <laughs> Zevi, I'm really overwhelmed. 
So you want to hear about the, the journey? Yeah, we, we always love to begin here with the personal side, with the journey, because people are really what, what the story is made of. And we love to hear your journey, how you came to, to who you are today, sitting across from us, how you came to be the renowned or cook scholar. T- take us, take us from, from, from as far back as you want to go. Yeah, well, let's go back to early childhood. <laughs> In fact, that's a very important teaching of, of Cook, that we need to get in touch with those mitzotzei kedusha, those sparks of holiness in our early childhood. Those are the most precious sparks we'll ever have in a lifetime. And unfortunately, many of us have lost touch with those sparks. So let's go back to to my earliest sparks. I am from Maine. I'm from Bangor, Maine. That's where my journey begins this lifetime. And, you know, the, the great Hasidic teachers, Rabbi Yisrael Bar Shem Tov, and his great grandson, Rabbi Nachman Brestover, spent a lot of time out in the woods in isolation, what the Brestover is referred to as Hitbodedut. And I had no problem accessing the woods. They were right in my backyard. My paternal grandfather had gifted me a book when I was a child. It was a, an English biography of the Baal Shem Tov. And I read how the Baal Shem Tov did it, and I said, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and I would spend long days doing what I would call now a voda. Avoda, doing spiritual work out in the woods, communing with nature. You know, in the Tanya, you know Tanya better than I do. The Balatanya quotes, Hateva begematri alokim. Nature, Hateva, has the same numerical value as the word for God, Elohim. They're both 86. So that's a very important teaching of Hasidut, which I subscribe to to this day, that one of the the vehicles that we have for getting in touch with Elohut, Getlech Kai, godliness, is nature, going out to, to nature. God speaks to us through nature. So that's the the Hasidic component. There's also a Litvak in me. By the way, I'm I'm of mixed parentage. It's a combo of Hasidim and Misnagdim. Yes. Rabbi, now, can I can I ask you? The the audience is really a universal audience, and if I know this may be very difficult in a conversation like this, but if if we ever use a Hebrew or Jewish term, if we could uh, try at least define to, terms to define terms, please, yes. You were saying that you're, you're, you come from mixed parentage. Of yeah, parentage. so a mixed milieu. On, on the one hand, uh, you had misnagdim. Just quickly for uh, our listeners, what, what, yeah. is, what is a misnagd or what is the... Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I never defined those terms. Okay. So back in the 1700s, when the Baal Shem Tov came along with this new movement, it was a, revi- a, a spiritual revival movement which came to be known as Hasidism, there were those who opposed it. There were those who opposed this new movement. They opposed the innovations of this movement. And this divide continues to this day, although there have been attempts, many attempts at rapprochement to bring together left left, left hemisphere and right hemisphere. But there is a great divide to this day, honestly. You know, there are people who view themselves as Hasidim, followers of the, the Baal Shem Tov, 
And then there are others who view themselves as misnagdim, as opponents of, of Hasidism. So there are those who uh, identify with the Vilna Gaon, and they're called mit, mitnagdim. Misnagdim are opponents. And Hasidim uh, are pietists. That's the, the plural form. The singular form is Hasid. Hasid is a, a pious person. Ultimately, it comes from the word chesed, which is love. That's a very important teaching of Ramchal, Ramosha Chaim Nitzato, and of Rav Kook, that if you want to be a true chesed, it's all about chesed, which is love. But uh, to, to go back, so I started to tell you about my experience in the main woods. I was preceded by Thoreau. David Thoreau. He was also very fond of the of the Maine woods. You know, there, there were some interesting things going on in New England. They were called the New England Transcendentalists. There was Emerson, who dabbles in, uh, in Buddhism, and and uh, there's Thoreau. They're also into uh, Swedenborg. It, it, it was there was a lot of mysticism in there. So I was not the first one to find God in, in the main woods. But as I started to tell you, I also found God in Torah and Torah studies. So I kind of gyrate between the two today. You know, there are times when I'm locked away in my Dalit Amos here, which is very intense. And there are other times I go out to the, the woods to seek God. So these are the, the two legacies. And so I grew up with all of these different voices in my head, and my heart. And I think this positively predisposed me to become a Talmud of Rav Kook, because Rav Kook is an amazing synthesis of these two Eastern European traditions of, you could call them Misnagdism and Hasidism. Through his mother, he had a very strong connection to Chabad. Going, again, going back to early childhood. And through his father, who, as I said, was a, uh, of a large Talmud, but also in the father's line, Rav Cook's paternal ancestor was one of the, the first 10 Talmidim. This is the, uh, the original minion of Talmidim of the Balazhna Yeshiva. And that, that's Rav Cook's paternal legacy. So as a child, Rav Kook is hearing two voices in his head. You know, we can call it left hemisphere and right hemisphere. And the, the left hemisphere is the legacy of the Vilna Gaon through Rav Chaim Belozhner and, and through Rav Kook's own paternal ancestry, uh, the Yafif family. And that's the left hemisphere. And the right hemisphere goes back to the, the Kapis de Rebbe, who's a grandson of the Tzemach Tzedek, who's the grandson of Shner Zalman of Liadi, who's the founder of Chabad. And Chabad is a very unique dynasty within the Hasidic movement because it's the one form of Hasidism that speaks to a Litvak. So if you're a Lithuanian Jew who is very textually oriented, very left hemisphere, most of the Hasidic movements are, are not going to speak to you. They, they cannot invade your, your left hemisphere. But there's one <laughs> which is highly invasive which is able to, to get into that left hemisphere, and that's Chabad. And this was a, a school of Hasidism that was founded by this Rabbi Shner Zalman, brought back from Mizrich to Lithuania, designed, packaged to appeal to a Litva. The point is that it's a, a branch of, Has of Hasidism that speaks to an intellectual. It's an intellectual form of Hasidism. More kavut, amazing complexity of Rav Kook. In order to understand Rav Kook, 
you have to study all of the different traditions that are informing his neshama, his, his soul. I, I, I guess I'm saying I always gravitated to these uh, hybrids who were trying to synthesize and put together left hemisphere and right hemisphere Judaism. And it suited my neshama because that's what I'm all about. But the way I, I came to Rav Cook, and I think that's really what you'd love to hear by now. <laughs> the first yeshiva I attended was what we would call religious Zionist in Washington Heights. It no longer exists. It was called Yeshivat Rabbeinu Moshe Soloveitchik, and received a wonderful <laughs> education there. And if I know the, the Hebrew language, in, in any depth, it's because of the education I received there. To this day, I have such a, a great love of, of Lashon HaKodesh, of, of the sacred tongue. I come to Baltimore. I studied in Yeshiva Ner Yisrael in Baltimore. So there is a base madrash where you can sit and study Torah, but the, the chassid in me took to the woods, Kedarki Bakodesh. I picked up where I left off as a child in Bangor. And in the woods, there was a stream. And I would take out to the, the woods with me three svarim. One was Mar Nebuchim of the Rambam, Guide of the Perplexed. The second one was the Tanya, which is the Torah B'Shebech of Hasidut. That's the, the, the written Torah of Hasidism. And the third one was Likutei Moran of Reb Nachum Brasover. And I'm trying to create for myself a world based on those three svarim. How, how old are you at the time? Probably 18, 19. I'm trying to create a, a spiritual world for myself. So these were the three, uh, the three legs. You know, it's a tripod. These are the Shloshet uh, Amudim of my universe. There's the, the Rambam Mar Nebuchim, there's the Tanya, and there's Likutei uh, Moran of Rav Nachman. Fridays, we could uh, go into town, because Yeshiva's in Pikesville, which is outside of Baltimore, but Fridays, we could go into town, and there there was a place called Baltimore Hebrew College, and I was able to borrow uh, books, and one time I, I lugged home a Rota Kodesh of Rav Kook. And so I brought it back to my dorm room and I'm sitting, I'm studying it. I don't understand one word of what the man is talking about, but I'm getting high. <laughs> if, again, if you'd ask me, what did the man say? I, I, I would be at a loss because the language of Rav Cook is so highfalutin, but I'm just, I'm like, I'm just like, I'm getting out of body from this. I don't know what's going on. And the next thing I know, I felt a presence hovering over me. So you say, what's the Shechina or it's Rav Cook or something. And I look up and it's the Mashkiach of the Yeshiva. The Mashkiach is the, the supervisor, the... the- The spiritual supervisor. So this is a very tense moment. I'm looking up at him, he's looking down at me. And I'm wondering uh, what's gonna come out of this because this is not part of the curriculum of the yeshiva or of the Kodesh by Rav Kook. And he never said a word, but he himself was a closet cooking. <laughs> so I'm in the yeshiva it, it reached a point where it was untenable. I, I just, I, it was, it was not a good fit. The, the whole uh, environment, the whole milieu, it, it was not a good fit. And I was getting sicker and sicker until finally I decided I have to leave. And now we're going back to Bangor, Maine. I'm at a crossroads. 
I've lost a world. It's a whole world. It's called Olam HaYeshivo, the Yeshiva world, which I lived in for some years. And I don't have another world. I'm a man without a world. I'm really lost. And you know how it is when you're really lost. You can read anything at that point. So I picked up at random autobiography of a yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. I'm just giving you an example of I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, a man drowning. I'm just uh, clutching at any, I'll read anything at this point. So I said to myself, you know what? Those volumes over there, they're called Igrot Raya, the letters of Rav Kook. Yeah, but I never opened them. So now I pulled the volume off the shelf, and there's a cake of dust on it, yay high, which I, I, I blow off. And I open up at random to a page. And what I saw on that page caused a total meltdown. I just broke down bawling like a baby. And I said, this is my Rebbe. And I was around 20 at, at the time. And, you know, so that's, uh, it's almost 50 years now. Rev Cook is my Rebbe. And I tell people if, if it was not for two individuals, I don't know how I could be a, a, a Torah Jew without these two. One was my paternal grandfather. He's the one that gave me the, the English biography of Baal Shem Tov when I was a, a boy. And the other one is Rav Cook. Now, I could be a secular Jew, and there are many secular Jews, and, you know, they're very holy people. Uh, but to be a Torah Jew, if it was not for these two, I don't know how I would be a Torah Jew today. So one was my paternal grandfather and the other was Ruf Cook. And what, so you wanna know what's written on that page. So I'll good. tell you what's written on the page. Basically, in so many words, he was, he was saying to me, it's hollow, you're okay, mm -hmm. they're crazy. He ratified my, my sanity because I was starting to question my own lucidity. There were voices that were telling me that there's no room for someone like me in, in the yeshiva world and probably not in, in, in Judaism. And Rav Cook flipped it around and he said, you're fine. You want to study more Nebuchadnezzar? It's beautiful. You want to study Tanya? God love you. We could tell you, Maran, delicious. They're crazy. <laughs> okay. So I'm giving you a very coarse version of it. As I said, Rav Cook's language is very highfalutin. And, and what he was saying was, look, we, we have a dilemma. Young Jews are leaving Judaism by droves. Why? Because it doesn't speak to their soul. What we give them is, it's called the pots and pan religion. Meaning, you know, if, uh, if a milchika spoon goes into a fleshy pot, well, you know, I, I guess on some level that could be translated into Kabbalah and Hasidus, but for most of us, it's not going to happen. It doesn't speak to our neshama. And that's Judaism. That's the way Judaism is presented. That's the whole thing. And he said, what we, we, we have to do is we have to share the goodies. We have goodies. And we're very stingy. And we're not sharing them. We have uh, Rambam and Mor Nevuche, And we've got a Tanya. we got a Likute Moran. It's a wealth. And we're comes on him, we're very stingy, and we say, no, 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 you'll just learn 
the Mara, not even the Agarita, just the Halacha. And you'll quetch, you'll make the Yukim Rabbam if it's Tzvedinim or Chefz Gavra, and, and then Shulchan uh, Aruch, and uh, you know, Shach and, 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 and Taz. And, and, that, and that's supposed to be Machaya, that's supposed to give life to a, a young Jewish man or woman. He said, break out the goodies. We have such a wealth. We, we've, we've got Kabbalah, we've got poetry, we've got uh, Hasidu, we, ha we have Hakira, philosophy, share the goodies. And, and so that's pretty much what Rav Cook was saying, that there's nothing wrong with you. What you're doing is fine. The people that are delegitimizing and they want you to study only Nigla de Reise, you know, the Halacha. There's something wrong with those people. They, they, they're like, <laughs> they're, they're the ones who are, they need some kind of, I don't know, reality check or something. And Rav Cook said, I'm going to create a revolution. I call it the rebirth of Agadah. So I, I left near Israel. I go to uh, back to Bangor. I get a degree in philosophy from the University of Maine. I come back to New York. I study Jewish philosophy at Bernard Rebel Graduate School under Arthur Hyman. So I was already a cookie in, in America. Uh, since that meltdown experience with the Igrot Raya in Bangor, Maine. And there's a lot of territory in between till I get to Yerushalayim. We, can't, we cannot go to Berkeley, California. We cannot go to Paris, France. This, this is a, <laughs> and I arrive in Yerushalayim. I'm a newlywed. A day or two later, I'm in the home of Rav Tzvi Kohen Cook. I don't know him. He doesn't know me. My wife is with me. We're, as I said, we're newlyweds. And all of a sudden, the door opens, and I see a Rosh Yeshiva walking backward. I think this is something. I've never seen that before. He's walking out backwards. And the next thing I see in the door frame, a little malach, a little angel with a white beard and this light coming off his face. And he motions to us to come in. That was Rav Tzviyoda Kohen Kuk. And the two of us are talking. And at a certain point in the conversation, he says to me, I feel as if we have known each other for 40 years. So I, I'm sure that my ears are playing tricks on me. So I asked him to repeat this. And again, he says, I feel, in Ivrit, I feel as if we have known each other for 40 years. And that was the beginning of uh, an intimate relation, <laughs> walking, I just walked in off the street and evidently Rav Tzuda had an intuition that we have some very strong uh, soul connection. And it was the beginning of a relationship. But how did the conversation begin? You get one line, it's got to be good. So I'm thinking, what is the one line that I can say to this man? Now, this man is in his high 80s, I'm 25, he doesn't know me, I don't know him, I gotta make it good, because otherwise I'll be out in, I don't know, in the, you know, 30 seconds. So I said to him in my best Hebrew, Kama avat Yisrael haita la'aba shalcha, how much love of Israel, of the Jewish people, did your father have? I'm thinking this is going to get me in good. This is he's going to go for it. The next thing I know is he bursts out laughing. He's laughing his head off. 
And I'm saying, oh my God, what? <laughs> I had one opportunity, I missed it, something. So after he <laughs> was able to compose himself once again, he explained to me what was so laughable in my statement. And he says, Avat Yisrael, love of the Jewish people, my father loved the whole world. And now he begins to go down in the, the levels. And there's a plant there somewhere. And he, and he points to the plant. He says, a filotzomeach, even plants, trees, grass. And then, you know, in Yerushalayim, the, the floors are made out of stone. So he raps on the stone floor and he says, a filo domain, even mineral. And sure enough, in Orota Kodesh, you'll find things where Rav Cook is ecstatic about rocks, about minerals. So that's what he found so hilarious about the statement. Like, what's the big deal? My father loved Jewish people. Of course he loved Jewish people. My father loved the entire cosmos, the entire universe. And that was the beginning of the relationship. It started with that. That was the, my opening line and his opening reply. Someone else I'm a great admirer of, besides Ruth Cook, is Jonathan Swift, uh, Gulliver's Travels. And when you first come into the book, the, the Lilliputians, and they've been fighting for years and years against their neighbors. What, what is the big issue at stake? At what end to open the egg? When you, you boil an egg and you want to eat the egg. So where do I crack the egg? Do I crack it at the top or at the bottom? And this is the cause for a world war and their little war. There are people who are capable of what I call planetary consciousness. Most of us, unfortunately, are not. Rav Cook has something called Shir Merubah. That's the title that Nazir gave to it. The Nazir was Rav Cook's editor. The Nazir took eight journals, eight diaries of Rav Cook, and boiled them down to what he called Orota Kodesh which is Rav Cook's magnum opus. And he would take an entry from the journal and give it a title. So this particular entry from Rav Cook's journal, he called Shir Merubah, which means a, a fourfold song. And what Rav Cook does is he describes the different levels of consciousness of different human beings and they form concentric circles. So you start with the human who's totally egocentric, you might call that person a narcissist, and the whole universe consists of me, myself and I. And then hopefully a person you might also call it infantile omnipotence. Maybe, you know, being is able to graduate from that to a, a higher level of consciousness beyond the, the ich, the I, the anochi, or ani. And now, you take into account other human beings. And, you know, which is probably your family. It's probably your, your nuclear family or maybe your, your extended family, but not more than that. And that's, uh, that's my world vision. That's my Weltanschauung. It's me, my wife, my children, my sons-in-law. Yeah. Okay. And there are people who graduate beyond that. And we call them patriots, where they love not only themselves and their family, they love the whole nation, whatever your nation is. If you're a Jew, of course, it's uh, 
It's Klal Yisrael, it's Knesset Yisrael, it's the Jewish people. If you're Irish, it's the Irish people. But it's still confined to one nation. It's, it's call it nationalism, tribalism. But then there are people, and this is Rav Cook, and there are others, it's not only Rav Cook. It could be Sri Aurobindo too, you know. It could be Teilhard uh, de Chardin. That, as Rav Tzviuda said to me, they love it all, the entire universe, the, the whole thing. And that's what we have to strive for. And that's what our teachers have to do for us. They have to pull us up by our bootstraps but they keep our spiritual development arrested at the stage of tribalism or nationalism. And we need to get beyond that. The time has come. The time is ripe for this, okay? We need to join the, the universe. We, we're Lilliputians, we're spiritual Lilliputians. We're fighting over which end to uh, open the egg at. Uh, recently, I posted something which is very much in the spirit of Rav Kook. It's a quote from L'Chadodi by Rabbi Shlomo Halevi Al-Kabetz. And it goes, Minus Motifrozi, Ve'et Hashem, Ta'aritzi, and I translate the English as follows. Transcend right and left, right is with the capital R and left is with the capital left, and love God. Because in the United States today, that's where we're holding now, as I'm sure you're well aware. People are uh, in lockdown. Now, this is <laughs> besides the, the lockdown because of COVID, but we're in some kind of uh, political or spiritual lockdown mode where the right is in lockdown mode, the left is in lockdown mode. It's never been this bad in the United States before. And I have 70 years of experience living in this country. And I I lived through the Nixon era and the Vietnam War and all of that, but I don't recall it. Uh, the, the, you have rightists, you have leftists. So what I'm trying to tell whoever listens to me, Yamin usmol tifrotsi, let Hashem ta'aritsi. Transcend right and left and love God. And this is very much from Rav Kook. Now, you know, it's Aniya uh, Katan, it's Betzalel Naor who's applying this, but that's very much Rav Kook. You know, I, I translate into English Orot, uh, which is uh, Rav Kook's seminal work. It was published in Yushalayim 1920 Orot. And in there, he, he says the same thing. We've got the, the, the right and the, the left, and we have to get beyond this. Yes. So, Rabbi Nahar, in our pre-conversation conversation, you sketched out a, a schema of how to understand of Cook's thought in application to this idea, which you're explaining now which was the notion of two forms of unity of borrowing from Kabbalistic language, um, and each one operating at a different level of, of striving towards this universal idea. And I think you know what I'm referring to. If you could elaborate on that, because I thought it was, it was very poignant and very powerful and very poetic. And I would, love to, I would love to hear that, and I'm sure the audience would as well. What is the higher unity and what is the lower unity? So I'm going to give you a rough and ready explanation, and, and please don't be insulted. You know, as a Hasid Chabad, it's going to be so simplistic it may be insulting, but this is the best I can do. I'll try to do justice. In Yehuda Tata'a, in the lower unity, the, the various elements retain their integrity. 
I don't know, a bottle of water is a bottle of water, uh, uh, eyeglass, eyeglasses. But we're able to see how there is a unity that connects them all together. We'll call it Einstein's unified field theory or some such thing. <clears throat> Sometimes there, there are moments of grace, I'll call them, that we're able to rise to the higher unity. And in the higher unity, there's a dissolution, um, like a meltdown, Bitul uh, Hayesh. You know, my Rebbe is a star shell, you know that by now. Rebbe Aaron Halevi, Horowitz of uh, star And he's always talking about the Prate Hayesh the particulars of being. So what Rabbi Aaron Alevi is trying to do is put together constantly the ayin and the yesh, but he doesn't want to lose any of the yesh. Yesh means, okay, ayin means nothing and yesh means something. And all of the particulars, all of the details of the yesh are so delicious that he doesn't want to lose any of them. He, not, not one of the prote hayesh, the particulars. So that's Yehuda Tata, to preserve the yesh, but it's within a context of unity. But then there's the Yehuda Ilah, which is Ayin, which leaves behind all of this. All of this is dissolved in and a divine nothing, a divine no thing. See, now we're going to apply it to religions. And as I told you, Rav Kook goes through many different phases in the course of his spiritual journey. And his writings exist on many different levels of consciousness. And what I see in Rav Kook is sometimes he's doing what I'll call a Yehuda Tata'a, a lower unity, which means I'm not going to mess with the various religions. I'm going to preserve them. I'm going to leave them alone. If it's Catholicism, let it be Catholicism. If it's Jainism, let it be Jainism. I'm not going to mess with them. I'm going to, these are the Prate Hayesh. Why would I mess with them? As I quit to you, they're all Date Hamelech. So Rav Cook will tell you. There's a validity to all of these religions. They're all Date HaMelech. They're all religions of the king, of kings. Blessed be he, she, it. And I published something on Swarm blog. It's called The Universalism of Rav Kook. And I uh, mentioned there this legend of the Seamorg, which you know, it's done by a, a Persian Atar. And all the birds are looking, they're search, searching, they're seeking. They're looking for the legendary bird, the Seymour. That's, that's the, the vision quest. They're all looking for this, this mythic creature, the Seymour. It's some legendary bird uh, who will have the answers to their existential questions. And they arrive at the destination, and lo and behold, they discover the dawns on them. What is Seymour? It's two words in Persian. Not that I know Farsi, believe me. 30 birds. In other words, all of you together, all 30 of you together, you are the Seymour. It's called the Conference of, of Birds in English. And Rav Cook will go with this. Rav Cook will subscribe to this, that yeah, the, and it's more than just 30. Who knows how many religions there are today? You know, Chazal speak about Shiv Emu on the 70 nations, but the, I, I don't know. Maybe you know, but I'm sure there are thousands, thousands of religions. But to see the Yehuda Tata'a, the lower unity, how we can all come together, we're all spokes of the wheel. At the end of Masechet Tanit, this tractate of the Talmud. 
you have this image of the Machol at Sadiqim, that there'll be a circle, a dance circle of the Sadiqim. And each one will point to the center and say, Zek Heli Van Vehu, this is my God. And in our traditional literature, uh, uh, Rabbi Kiva Eger and, and many others have explained this mashal that each, each tzaddik has a, his or her own derech avoda, the way that they serve God. And in the center is God. So they're all like spokes of the wheel. Now, as I told you, in the, in the course of my journey, I had many teachers of all descriptions. And one of them is uh, Reb Zalman. And Reb Zalman extended it. You see, again, within the traditional literature, it remains within the Jewish fold. And there is a kind of beautiful pluralism, if I could use that term, where, where we acknowledge that each tzaddik worships in a different way, it's a different band of the spectrum. There's Sadmar and there's Lubavitch and there's Stolen. And... But Reb Zalman extended it to all of the religions of the world. And that all of these tzaddikim of the various faith communities, each one will point and say, Zekeli van Vehu, this is my God. So they're all spokes of, of the wheel. And God is at the center. Now we're going to graduate from the Yehudat Hata'a, from the lower unit to the higher unity. There are no Prateha Yesh, there's no Yesh, there's just Ayin. And Rav Kook reaches a point where he says, you know what, we're going to leave behind all of the religions. Goodbye. They're like, they're gone, they're vanished. And now we're coming into the realm of Ayin of the divine no things. So Rav Kook looks here and he looks there. He looks to the, the Yehuda Tata, the lower unity, and he sees there's no man. Ain, the key word is Ain, Ayin. And this, my friend, my friends, is the key to understanding Rav Cook's fascination with the phenomenon of atheism, of kfira, which is very unique. Not a lot of rabbis are willing to find the nitzotz hakodesh, the spark of holiness in atheism. So what, what does atheism mean to Rav Cook? And it's throughout his writings, it's a recurring theme. We are graduating from more primitive conceptions of divinity to more refined, more advanced conceptions. Again, Rav Kook is preceded in this by Rav Nachman. You can find it in Likutei Moran, Kama, it's uh, Siman Vav, it's uh, Torah Krat Yoshua, where Rav Nachman says that even though you did shuva yesterday, you did, you repented, but today you have to do tshuva la tshuva. You have to repent the repentance. Why? Because the repentance that you did yesterday was based on yesterday's conception of God. But a day later, You've evolved spiritually, and you ha now have a more rarefied conception of God. And, and by today's standards, yesterday's conception of divinity amounts to no less than hakshamat elokut. It's corporealization of God. So you better do tshuva for that. You have to repent from that. So you get in Rab Nachman this idea that we're constantly growing spiritually. And what was for us yesterday, God, today is, is idolatry by today's standards. We've, we're beyond that. We've outgrown it. We've evolved beyond that spiritual. Rav Nachman does it on the individual level. Rav Cook does it on the collective level. 
He does it for Knesset Yisrael, for the Jewish people, but for all of mankind. And we're constantly growing and evolving spiritually, and we're throwing away the klipot, these are the, the husks, the, the shells. You can think of a spaceship, which as it moves through outer space is um, jettisoning parts, throwing this klipa away and that klipa until finally you get down to the, this, you know, the, 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 pure, the pure kernel, the essence. And so the human race has had to outgrow a lot of pueril, a lot of childish notions we had of God. God is, is a big daddy. So we need to outgrow all of this. God is not a big daddy. God is not a tzaddik with, with a, a long white beard. But the, the, the klipa daka, one of the last remaining klipot that we have to shed, is the notion that God exists. Anybody who comes out of the, the Kabbalistic tradition is going to view existence as a form of hakshamat alukut. It's a form of corporalization of God. It's attributing to God something which God is so far beyond. So I can't if, if I'm a Kabbalist, I can't say that God exists. It's, it's a, a false statement. It's not a true statement because God is beyond existence. That's the, the title of Rav Kook and Levinas and the non-existence of God. So this is another way to bring us all together where Rav Kook is saying, you know what? Forget the Yehuda Tata, forget the, the lower unity, the Seymour, where all the religions uh, come together, the Conference of the Birds is another way. It's called atheism. <laughs> and that's the Yehuda Ila'a. Do, do you mean to say that Rev Cook was advocating for atheism? Well, it's his peculiar Kabbalistic understanding of atheism. They yeah. What, what was Rev Cook's peculiar form of mystical atheism, if you could ex try explaining it to us? Yeah, um, it's getting beyond Chochmah, which is Yesh, to Ayin. How, how does one living today in, in the world that we're in, be they um, Jewish or not, believing or not even, how do they how can one reach the ayin, reach that place of nothingness from where creation is perpetual, that place of, of uh, plentitude, which is, which, is, which is empty, which is nothing, which is always and never? I, I think there's a certain uh, Ayin that, that we can reach on our own uh, with our God-given neshamot. Rav Kook, uh, in, in one passage, uh, says, uh, I thank God for having given, for having given me this neshama, where he's grateful to, to God for having received the soul that he did. So I think we'll call that the, the natural resources. On the other hand, as I told you, I did Shemush by Reb Zalman. But one of the things that I, I do believe in, and uh, Reb Zalman believed in, is that Tzomeach, he believed that that was uh, God's gift to our generation to, to open the, the doors of perception.
you know, as a child growing up, I, I worked for many years with, without the Tzomeach, without Domain, just from my kishkas, you know. And that, that was the, the natural resources that God gave me. But I believe that, that there could be allies, there could be technology. It would have to be a sacrament at that point. You'd have to do uh, a lot of avoida. You'd have to work very hard learn a lot of Hasidus. <laughs> that's, that's what I can report, you know. Mm. That was definitely unexpected. Thank you for, thank you for your, your enduring intellectual honesty um, from your 20s all the way through now. And uh, we should see the day of, of MS Minar's Titzmach, which is maybe connected okay. to anything before as well. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I hope we'll, we'll meet again. I hope so. Okay. And I hope I hope we I hope we stay in in in, uh, in Kesher until that until that time comes. Amen. Amen. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you. You know, I, I cannot express my gratitude to you. Mm. I'm I'm speechless. I'm at a loss for words. But in uh, Yetzir Hashem, we'll, we'll, we'll speak more in the future. It's a shame. Thank you.